Well, good morning. Welcome to Community Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you've come to worship the Lord together with us today. My name is Pastor Cameron, and I want to extend to you a warm welcome. If you're visiting for the first time today, I hope that you're able to get a a little connection card from a greeter this morning. We'd love for you to fill that out and uh, put in the offering box on the way out so we can have a record of your visit. If uh, you have children, second grade or below, the last song before the sermon, we dismiss the children uh, through these double doors on the side uh, to the children's wing for a lesson during the sermon time, and then you can pick them up after this morning's service. And we're just so grateful that you have come to worship the Lord with us today. I've been preaching a series through the mission of the church. Uh, Typically, I've been continuing through the Psalms, but we took a little break this year, as we did last year, to talk about four different aspects of the life of the church. Last week, we talked about outreach, and this morning, I'm going to be preaching on enfolding, which has the idea of how does the church fit together as a body, whether it's a new believer who's just come to Christ or someone who has been uh, walking with the Lord for years, how do we as a church function together and work for God's glory in his kingdom as we make disciples of Jesus Christ? So we're going to be focusing on that this morning in the sermon, and the whole service is going to be focused on the good news of the gospel that we have in Christ Jesus that empowers us to serve and love one another, even as we make disciples of Jesus Christ. We're going to open our service this morning then with Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 to 4, our call to worship. I'm going to invite you to read these words together with me as we begin. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. This is the great God who we've gathered to worship. So I'm going to invite Pastor Steve to come. We'll begin our service in song. Let's stand and sing, Come Thou Almighty King. song the last couple of weeks we're going to sing it this this morning my song is love unknown my savior's love to me Oh, 
seated. For our scriptural reading this morning, we'll be reading 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 2, 6. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have Come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. May we pray now. Father, we come to you so joyful that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. We're thankful that he pleads our cause. We're thankful that he defends us. And we're thankful that in him we pass from death into life. We're thankful that he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him because our righteousness does not exist. We're thankful that we have eternal life, we have a home in heaven, and now we just read, we ought to also now to walk as he walked. We're thankful this morning that you told us to run the race that is set before us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that gives us the air, the oxygen, the strength to do so. And at times we fall, often we fall, stumble, and come short, and yet you always pick us back up. We're thankful for your patience and for your great long suffering with us. We're thankful that we can read your word and by the Holy Spirit of God, we can grasp your truth piece by piece, line upon line, precept upon precept. And we're thankful that your Holy Spirit works in our lives, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We praise you this morning for your promises that are real and that keep us going. We look to you this morning for your country, for Israel, now under attack, and we're asking for your protection. We're praying, it would be wonderful to see even a cessation of, of these hostilities. We pray that you would, in your way, in your mode, uh, bring glory to your name. We pray that souls will be saved, even in spite of this, that you can bring good even out of evil. So we pray that you would intervene. We pray as you told us to pray. We ask for the peace, for your peace upon Jerusalem. We would ask for your blessing upon our country, that you would give good leaders. It would be wonderful to see Daniels raised up everywhere, and we would be happy for that. We'd like to see a Hezekiah or Josiah somewhere ruling in our land, but we ask in all of this, that you would help us to have the right hearts, no matter who is there, and in any circumstances, whatever conditions, help us to be content and to carry out your gospel mandate. <clears throat> we pray this morning for missionaries. We ask that the Lord of the harvest would send forth workers into the fields to bring the word of God. And we're thankful for whatever part we can play and help and 
to partner with. We pray for the Bjork family this morning in Croatia. Thank you for their ministry over the years. And they're in a country, but also they're in a particular place. They're in one, one zone, one, this one village, and from there they're going out with the gospel. We ask for new contacts in that village. We ask for opportunities for them to preach your truth and to teach the word of God. We ask for lasting fruit. We pray that souls will be one, discipled, and that whatever they learn, they will be able to pass on to others the same truths. And as we're going through translation work, uh, this can be a chore and a real, ta a real chore, and, a, and it has to be done precisely. Give them wisdom and understanding how to communicate effectively your word and your will. And we pray that you would help them to have even the, uh, additional funds. We pray whatever their needs would be met, and we pray that you would protect them and guide them this morning. We pray for the Piedmont Women's Center. Thank you for this ministry that touches many hearts and many lives every week. We're thankful for how you have raised, this, raised up this ministry. We ask your blessing for the Grove office. We pray for your blessing upon the Greer facility and also now for the new Powderville place that's opening. We pray that you would give good workers, bless those who administer, bless those that answer the phones because they're the first ones, first contacts. Bless the medical personnel that, work, that works in these facilities and bless those counselors. Give them great wisdom, discernment, how to use the scriptures for the, the folks that come in with heavy hearts, burdens, needs. And we pray that you would use this place, this ministry to win souls for the glory of God and also to save lives for your glory also. We're thankful for this ministry, this church, and thank you for the lessons being taught here for the Adult Bible Fellowship, for the Sunday School classes that really want to teach from the youngest to the oldest. And we all need to have your instruction we're thankful for the preaching, for the singing, and for just for the time to worship you. Uh, we will have a week before us, again, to run the race. And so we ask that you would feed us this morning, give us the encouragement, the water that we'll need, the help that we need to, to do your bidding. Help us to be faithful. Help us to take from this how to, to live peaceably and to live justly, rightly in this ungodly world. Help us to be lights, help us to be salt of this earth, and use your word this morning in our lives. And we pray that Jesus will be lifted up, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated. We'll be in Romans chapter 12 this morning, Romans chapter 12. So I encourage you to turn there in your Bible. And as we do, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask him to bless our time together. Let's ask that God would truly speak from his word. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we have rehearse the gospel to ourselves this morning, even as we've worshiped you for it. And we've been reminded that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we've been reminded, Lord, of our sinful, wandering hearts, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Can we pray this morning as we look into your word, that you would indeed speak, that you would help what we've prayed. This dedication, here's my heart, O Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed do that for us, that you would help us as we consider our part in this glorious church that you have created, that, Lord, you would till up the soil of our hard hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would remove the dross of the sin that so easily besets us. We pray that you would give us eager and willing hearts to do what you've called us to do out of love for you and love for each other. And we thank you that your word can help us to do this. So please give us the grace that we have asked for now that we might fit together as a body that glorifies you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we've taken a break from our series to the Psalms, like I mentioned, uh, to focus on the mission of the church. Last week talking about outreach and now this week talking about enfolding. How the church fits together matters to God. You know, it's true if a person's just accepted Christ and they're a baby Christian who's coming into the life of the church, or if there's a mature believer who's come to a local church like Community Baptist Church, how we fit together, or if you've been in this church for decades, how we fit together matters. And I'm really thankful that this topic has come up today because there are several people who have expressed a desire to join in membership at Community Baptist Church, and it's something that uh, we always do is we introduce these people to you in the congregation as we'll vote on them uh, for membership next week, but it's also a great illustration of what I'm talking about this morning. So I'm going to read the names of these individuals, and they can stand, and then uh, you can see who they are. Um, Patrick Ashmore, he's already back there in the sound booth, uh, Emily Windorf right here. Shannon Neds is not feeling well today. She's been very sick, so we'll be praying for her. Glad that she's doing better, but uh, she would love to be here with us. Uh, Donna Walker, I think I saw Donna over here, and then Jeff Ginger and Brian Hargraves over here, and uh, thank you so much. You can um, have a seat, and uh, the reason we do this is not to make them feel awkward for 10 seconds as you all stare at them, but that you would get to know them. Uh, we are serious about when people join here in the life of the church, that they be enfolded, that they fit in together well. And we want you to have the opportunity to get to know them a little bit as we'll be voting on them to join in membership next week at Community Baptist Church. You know, this relationship that we have with one another in the body of Christ really matters. So you should try to reach out, get to know and love these people, even as they get to know you. You know, studies show that if people do not develop genuine relationships, three to five genuine relationships in a church, when they join it, within a matter of months, they'll probably leave. And I believe that that's not just a mere statistic. I think it reflects a deeper reality that people are supposed to fit into a church. 
And not just our church, but any church that a person joins that's biblically faithful to the word of God, people should fit in. But how does this happen? How does the gospel teach us to fit together as a body? Well, we've turned to Romans chapter 12, and this text tells us how the church fits together. In the book of Romans, Paul has been talking to the first 11 chapters about the glories of the gospel, of the reality that we are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And now as we get to chapter 12, Paul then hinges on this gospel truth and tells the Romans that the gospel will now enable them to live lives of sacrificial service to God because of the gospel. So you'll notice these well-known verses in chapter 12 of Romans, verses 1 and 2 say, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he continues on through these two verses, and these have been preached many times. But today, I would actually like to focus on the verses that follow this hinging statement, that because of the gospel, we're to serve the Lord with our lives. But what does that look like? How should the gospel impact our body as the body of Christ, as we fit together as one. The simple point is that the gospel enables us to be living sacrifices who fit together as a body of Christ. And this is how it happens. First, the gospel fosters humility in us, a mutual humility that enables us to fit together. You know, if we're going to fit together as a body of Christ, we must reject proud thinking. Paul says in verse 2, you'll notice that we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And this is where the gospel helps us think humbly in our minds. So he says in verse 3, notice the emphasis on thinking. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So the gospel is to transform our thinking. And here we see that when Paul calls these believers to do it, he does it on the basis of a grace that God has given him in particular. He says, for by the grace given to me. And whenever he makes that statement, it's most often referring to Paul's apostolic authority. God had sent him as an apostle and a messenger to the churches to build up the church and establish it on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so there is authority behind this command that should not be discarded lightly. It's not a passing comment. It's not a suggestion. This is a clear command to the church. And notice it's for everyone among you, he says. He's speaking to every single believer in the church, to you and to me. And he's also speaking from experience. What he says here is very similar to what he had said to the church at Corinth. There are many believers in the Corinthian church who are very fascinating with the more astounding sign gifts of the Spirit, like speaking in tongues. And we're going to compare this passage with 1 Corinthians a lot as Paul talks about this. But for now, let's just notice that he's got some experience here. He has authority as he's weighing in on this topic, and he is addressing this truth to our minds. There's a play in word here in the Greek that we could easily miss in the English, and it's this. We could basically say, do not think of yourself with excessive thinking, but with sober thinking. In other words, what you think about yourself matters. How you view yourself matters. It was a virtue in Greek culture to have a level-headed estimate of oneself. And applied to Christians, this meant that they were to guard themselves against pride, against elevating themselves as more important than other believers in the body of Christ. Because in our sinful flesh, it's very natural for us to become the center of our universe, isn't it? To elevate ourselves as the most important person. Recently, the social media app Snapchat created a bit of anxiety and a stir. They have this function in the app where you can see how you rank in your friend's universe. So people would go in, they look, and at the center of the universe is the sun. 
and that's whoever the person is. So on Snapchat, you're the center of your universe, you're the sun. And then your next closest friend, your best friend, is like Mercury, circling closely around the sun. And then each planet goes out farther. And so teens go in, they look at this app, and they see where they're ranked among their friends, and it causes a lot of anxiety and pressure for them because they're not as important as they thought they were. And they grow anxious as they look where they rank in their friend's universe. But if you think about it, this is really impossible, isn't it? It's impossible for all of us to be at the center of the universe. We can't all be suns, right? And as we discovered a long time ago, even we aren't the center of our universe, right? The earth is orbiting around the sun. So how are we to view ourselves? What is our standard of measurement if we aren't at the center of the universe? Well, notice in verse 3 he says that we think with sober judgment, there at the end of the verse, each according to to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now this phrase, the measure of faith, could be referring to the different measures of spiritual gifts that were given, that we all have different kinds of spiritual gifts, and so we engage and and, uh, consider ourselves in light of each other. But the problem is, is that actually tends towards pride, doesn't it? As we are tempted to evaluate and compare ourselves and think whether or not we're better than others or or where we rank. Instead, this phrase, the measure of faith, the word faith has an article in front of it referring to the faith, which means the faith of the gospel. What Paul is saying to these Roman Christians is that as they considered, because he's going to get to their giftedness, he is talking about this grace that God has assigned to them, but as they do, they need to measure themselves by the standard by which we all are measured by, and that's the gospel. All of us, as we confess this morning in the service, have sinned. We're all sinners in the need of the grace of God. We all are coming before God for grace and for forgiveness, for reconciliation with him, because none of us can earn merit or favor with God on the basis of our own good works. And because of what Jesus Christ has done, we all turn to him in faith, knowing our deep need of a Savior. We must all repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's according to this standard that we first measure ourselves by. We get a healthy estimate of ourselves when we realize we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It has been said, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, meaning there's no one who stands in a higher standing when we consider our sinfulness before God. So if you want to get a sober, clear-headed estimate of yourself, stand at the foot of the cross. Realize your own sinfulness as you bow before your Savior and look to Him for saving grace. And then, then look around the room and see all the sinners gathered around you beneath the foot of the cross, all standing on the same level. That's what the gospel teaches us. It humbles us in our minds. But what Paul is going to do is he's going to take this idea and now apply it to the reality that we are different. It doesn't mean that we're all just uniformly the same, even though the gospel humbles all of us. So he says that we do this according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And he's going to hinge into now how we are one body but many members. But before we get there, I just want to think of a few applications as we think about how the gospel humbles us. I think that when we think about the gospel and our need for grace as sinners, it guards us against two types of pride. One type of pride is deflated pride. Another type of pride is inflated pride. Well, what do I mean that, by that? Inflated and deflated pride. Several years ago, we bought a wagon for our kids so we could pull things out to the beach, and they also like to ride in this wagon and be pulled around. But the tires are built in such a way that if you don't keep a careful eye on them with the fluctuating temperatures and all the things that go on in the garage, the tires will deflate easily. And then it's practically useless. I mean, I could try to pull my kids around in the wagon, but it's not going to be very fun for me, at least. They might like it, but I won't. And it could probably hurt the wagon, too, as they're they're just dragging along. And deflated pride is like that. When you become depressed, a deflated tired, because you haven't achieved what you think you deserve in your pride, It becomes this type of wrong thinking where we don't measure ourselves according to the gospel. You know, we can be 
tempted to think that God is indebted to give us whatever we want. That we should be a certain way and things should go a certain way. We can be tempted in our pride to think that we deserve something from God. And this is harder to spot. This kind of pride is harder to spot because discouragement in the Christian life is legitimate, right? We can grow discouraged. But many times we grow discouraged because we're too proud and we think too highly of ourselves. On the flip side is inflated pride, which is what we tend to think of when our head grows too big and we we think that God actually needs us, that we deserve what we achieved, that God's indebted to me. He's given me, he hasn't given me things that, um, you know, I need. It's more like I'm, I'm God's best gift to himself. And if anyone criticizes you or doesn't give you the respect you think you deserve, you blow up like an overinflated tire. And these two types of pride lead to two types of problems or responses. If you live in deflated pride, you will withdraw. You will become quiet and angry and sullen and depressed if you don't think God's given you what you deserve. If you live in inflated pride, you'll grow angry, vitriolic, and defensive when God takes away things that you think you deserve. Do we see, dear Christians, how important it is to have a right estimate of ourselves in the gospel. We all need God's grace. And we may be tempted to think that if this battle is in our minds, then it's only going to impact us. That a wrong thinking won't have an impact on others, but this is actually where Paul goes in this text. He says that if we have proud thoughts, then it will impact other people in the body. And if we have humble thoughts, it will impact other people in the body. It impacts how we fit together. So notice, when we think humbly according to the gospel, it creates a unity amidst the diversity in the body of Christ. And that word diversity might make you nervous, because the way that it's used in our culture many times has a lot of different meanings than what God gives to us here in Scripture. But before our culture ever used the term, we realized that God gave us a biblical idea of how the church, in the midst of its diversity, was to be unified. And I think you'll find it really encouraging Paul gives us an illustration that he's used all throughout the New Testament, and it's an illustration of the human body. Notice verses 4 and 5. He says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. The analogy he set up is really easy to understand. We all have one human body, but that body is composed of many different parts. You have hands that grasp things and text on your phone, and your feet you don't normally use to text, do you? I don't think there's anybody in here who texts with their toes, not normally. The body, though one, has many different functions and many members, and so it is in the church. We are interrelated members who belong to each other. In this local church, we have many people with diverse gifts, but we're all made one through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this gospel should remind us that we all stand level at the foot of the cross and lead us to a humble unity, even as we start thinking about the different ways that we function that God has assigned. You know, we don't all function the same way. I once saw an interview with a man who went to church, but he didn't really view the church as a body. He would just come in, sit for the worship service because he wanted to be there to worship God, and then he would leave. And there were some people in the church who kept asking him to serve on the coffee team. And he refused for a while, but finally he gave in because they were persistent. And he said, When I started handing out coffee to people, I started realizing that God had made us a diverse body of believers, and I was made to be in relationship with them, just as I was made to be in relationship with God. And I started to love the church, and I started to love God's people. It was a simple act, but that man found his place in the body, and once he did, he began to see the great unity that God had created in the gospel, even amidst the diversity of the believers. So I told you we'd look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And what's really interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that Paul takes this body metaphor and he applies it to the two areas I just talked about, deflated pride and inflated pride. 
we see how this thinking changes the way they interact with one another. So to those with deflated pride, those who are discontent with the gifts God has given them, Paul says this, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. See, this person is discontent with their gifts. They want to be something else. And in their pride, they think they deserve to be something else. Verse 16, And if the ear should say, Because I am not the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Through the gospel, we humbly realize that God has created us with a diversity of gifts and empowered us to do that. And so I have an obligation to seek out my gifting and give thanks for it. I told a Sunday school class last week, and we're kicking off the Sunday school class on the one and others, that as we looked at this passage, and I've told some of you this before, that this reminds me of Mike Wazowski from Monsters Incorporated. Okay, when we get this perspective, look at him. He's basically one eye and one mouth, spindly legs, spindly arms. The only reason I put it up here is because some of you might not know what I'm talking about, and so I want us all to see what I'm talking about. And if we always had our way, the body of Christ might look like this at times, and we chuckle, right? It's kind of funny, but that's not what God designed us to be. He designed us to be beautifully proportionate. He created us to fit together with different parts, hands, arms, feet, legs, mouth, ears, eyes, all of it together. And so when we think humbly about our gifting and our calling, we should give thanks to God for how he has made us and where he has put us and ask him to grow us in that. This is how we think humbly about the gospel and give thanks for what God has made other people that he has plugged them into the body in a certain way, in a certain proportion. Otherwise, we're tempted to this deflated pride, this kind of dragging attitude towards the Lord. To those with inflated pride, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12. Notice the arrogance that's coming through here. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Then on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. Then our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, we cover our feet with shoes, not because our feet are unimportant, but because we walk on them. And you want comfortable shoes so that you can walk well, don't you? Also, sometimes feet aren't so pleasant to look at. So you want to have nice shoes that dress it up a little bit. And to those that think that because other people see them more, they're more important to the body, God says you've got it all wrong. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Every single person is necessary and important to this body and deserves the same amount of care. Why? So that we would all have unity as a diverse group of believers. Not division, not pride, but unity through humility. This is how the church fits together. So let the gospel transform your thinking as you consider your place in the body, let it call you to humility and not pride. And when you do, you will discover a fresh motivation to serve in the body. As the gospel transforms our thinking, 
Paul tells us that this will compel us to serve, to be living sacrifices. So notice second that the gospel empowers service as it fosters this humility. We're going to talk a lot about what we're called to do and how we will serve, but just notice what Paul grounds it in. First of all, he tells us that what God has done always enables what we must do. And we've seen this as a pattern in the book, right? The first 11 chapters in Romans are all about what God has done, the gospel that we believe. And now, from chapters 12 to the end of the book, he's going to talk about what we must do. But we should never forget that what we're called to do is always grounded first in what God has done and his grace that motivates us. So Paul takes an opportunity here just to remind them of this fact here as we read together in verse 6. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. That's important language. Notice he is intentionally reminding them that God has given them grace. The word for gifts here in verse 6 is the word charismata in the Greek. And you may notice it's similar to the word charismatic from which we get the term the charismatic movement which focuses on spiritual gifts. This word focuses on the spiritual gifts God has given to people, the charismata. But notice the second word here. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace. That word grace is charis in the Greek. It's the root for charismata. And so the charismata, the spiritual gifts that you have, are given to you by the charis, the grace of God. And this helps us as we begin in two ways. First of all, as we've seen, it kills pride. As we realize that all of this has been given to us by the grace of God through the gospel, we have no room to boast. But also, if God has given us these gifts, then we have no excuse for wasting them. This is a call to action, that God has empowered you to serve, so now you must go and serve. Let us use them. Notice it, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And Paul's going to list many different kinds of spiritual gifts here as we look into this text. But with every gift, he gives a supporting phrase that might seem a little bit redundant. You notice as he begins in verse 7, he says, If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching. And you might wonder, why does he repeat himself? Because he is underscoring the point that if you have a gift, you need to use it. Let us serve one another. He's repeating it for emphasis, a call to action. Your gift is not for you. Your gift is for the body of Christ. So he says in verse 6, If prophecy... Uh, I'm sorry, in verse, uh, at the beginning, at the end of verse 6, yes, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. This is one of the main gifts that Paul repeats over and over again, brings up early and often. So it's super important in the life of the church. The gift of prophecy speaks about giving revelation of God to the church. In that time in the church, with the gifts that God had given, there were people who would stand up and proclaim truths about God that he had revealed to them. But whenever someone did this, it needed to be measured. It needed to be weighed. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. And here in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, this word in proportion has the idea of putting something in proper relationship like a, a logical proposition or a mathematical equation. Now, many of you may have not liked math and figuring out math equations, but there's a logical sequence of events and orders that need to be, uh, rules that need to be followed to understand something properly. The church historian Josephus used this word to describe the porticos in the temple. He said that they were proportionate to the building. They were fitting in how they were used. So when a prophet would speak truth to God's people, it needed to cohere with the orthodox truths of the Christian faith. It needed to be weighed with what God had said in Scripture and the teaching of the apostles. Now, the gift of prophecy in this sense is not active today. The, the canon of Scripture has been closed. We have God's full word revealed to us. But there is a sense in which we still must apply this principle by comparing Scripture with Scripture. 
God has given us the full revelation of his word in scripture. So we do not teach or preach our own words. We must teach what aligns with the word of God in God's mind for the good of his people and for God's glory. You know, we had a wonderful example of this last week. I love listening to our elders preach, and they each have different styles and ways that they, they preach. And one thing I appreciate about Frank Devanyo is that he brings in multiple passages of Scripture whenever he preaches, comparing Scripture with Scripture and filling our minds with the truth. As we teach according to the standard of Scripture, we are humbly submitting to it. Notice the next gift he lists. In verse 7, he says, If service in our serving. That is the word diakonian, which may sound familiar to you because it's where we get our word deacon from. The word deacon simply means servant, and often in the Bible this word is translated as minister or ministry. All Christians are called to serve as we follow in the footsteps of our Savior Jesus Christ, who came not to be served but to serve. And yet there are some Christians who are more geared towards service, right? You wouldn't want to be caught dead up here speaking, you know, you just, it's not your thing. You'd rather be quietly serving somewhere unnoticed. And what Paul is saying is, that's a good thing. It's not a problem. So serve. We should wash feet from a heart of humility, not just externally, but with joyfulness in our service to the Lord. So he continues on, he says, the one who teaches in his teaching. We discussed how the gift of prophecy is new revelation has ceased, but the gift of teaching has not ceased in the sense that God has gifted those in the church to bring forth the word of truth and to expound on it and to apply it to God's people. And so it is that teachers must feed the word of God to people, not for selfish gain, but for the good of feeding the flock. And that familiar gift is followed up by another less familiar gift. Notice verse 8. He says, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. What I find really interesting is that Paul paired exhortation together with the gift of teaching. Because what you have been taught must be brought to bear on how you live your life. And this word, exhortation, talks about a person who comes alongside other Christians and encourages them to do what they've been taught. I've had several knee surgeries on my right knee, and as I've been in therapy and uh, had those um, times where I needed to get my leg fully functioning again, one of the problems I discovered is if you don't use a muscle, what happens to it? It shrinks. It's called atrophy, and you need the strength of that muscle to help the body work properly. And so my physical therapist had this wonderful tool that I grew to hate at first, and then I learned to love. And basically what it was is this little box, and I had two uh, little wires coming from it, and then pads at the end of it. And he put one pad at the top of my quadricep, my leg muscle, and then he put another pad down to the bottom of it. And this was just after I'd, you know, been sitting around for a long time, and my, my leg had almost forgotten how to function. The muscle wasn't firing very well. So he pushed a button on that little device, and it sent an electrical impulse through my muscle and made it tighten. But it didn't just do that. It started out soft, then gradually it got stronger and stronger, and I had to flex my leg muscles with that device so that I would start lifting my legs up again. It was trying to stimulate my legs so that the muscles would function properly. And I was so happy when I didn't have to use that anymore. But it was necessary for me at that point. Now I can use the muscle, and it's much stronger than it ever would have been. And in the same way, what God is saying is that he uses believers in the body to stimulate us to love and to good works. Those who call us to apply what we have been taught. Right teaching is good and primary in a church, but it should never be alone. It is not designed to be by itself. So Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there are those who exhort us in the body. Paul moves on to those who have the gift of giving. He says the one who contributes in generosity. 
And of course, we are all called to contribute to the work of the ministry, but some have an ability to give abundantly above others. So in some ways, this applies to all of us, but especially to those who God has gifted with generosity. This word generosity can have the idea of giving freely, but really it's deeper than that. The word carries with it the idea of simplicity. It means that we give generously to others, but not with strings attached. Our giving is simple and pure. It's free from ulterior motives. We give for the good of the body and for the glory of Christ. Then Paul considers the next gift, the one who leads with zeal. This term could refer to anyone who has a position of leadership, perhaps at work for you or some other place where God's put you in a position of leadership. But in the context of the church, we really get a good example of what this looks like when talking of the elders of the church who were to eagerly lead the body. So Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Now notice this, not under compulsion, I have to do this, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, I'm just in it for the money, but eagerly, not domineering those in your charge, I'm just going to tell them what it is, give them what they deserve, but being examples to the flock. You see, just as we give in generosity without ulterior motives, so, and those who benefit from this giving should um, not, uh, just as we give without ulterior motives, so should we lead without ulterior motives, rather having a genuine desire for the good of God's people. Notice the final characteristic here, the one who does acts of mercy, this final gifting is to be done with cheerfulness. You know, acts of mercy can refer to giving to the poor, but it just has a broader meaning of helping those who are in need. Not just the poor, but the sick, the elderly, the disabled, any of those who are needy, this gift refers to helping. You know, initially, we might approach a needy situation with eagerness. You see someone who has a need, your heart is moved to pity and compassion, you step in. And then once you step in, what do you realize? Life is messy. There's a grind there. And it's hard. And so Paul's encouragement here is that as we step in, that we not grow discouraged, that we not grumble and complain, that once seemed like a great opportunity now becomes a chore. And that's the part where we can all be tempted to struggle, as it is within any of these gifts. We are called to use our gifts and serve, but any of our strengths can become one of our greatest weaknesses if we grow tired and weary and discouraged in serving in ministry. Sometimes we struggle to serve the body, and our flesh begins to take over as we live as living sacrifices. It's been said that living sacrifices tend to crawl off the altar. So how do we solve this problem? Paul has called us to a mindset of humility in the gospel. He's called us to a mindset of service in the gospel. And there's many other gifts we could talk about here, but this is just a little sample this morning. And now what he's going to do is he's going to motivate us to carry out our service through the love of the gospel. Notice finally with me, the gospel teaches us to love. If we are to fit together as a body of Christ, we need God's grace to serve one another in humble love. Even as God first loved us, so he exhorts these Christians to pursue genuine love. Read verse 9 with me. He says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Paul really transitions into a section where he's going to shoot out short staccato-like commands to these believers. It's a style that was called the paranesis, where a teacher strings together several exhortations without much elaboration. And Paul's point is that if they're going to live out the gospel in unity amidst the diversity of the church, it must all be done in love. He's going to point them to the greatest command, to love. You know, sometimes people say, preacher, just tell me what to do. Tell me how it is. Well, here you have it. Paul's point is that you love people from your heart as you serve them. 
And he doesn't give us the option of loving people half-heartedly or in a fake way. He doesn't give us the option of not loving people. He says, love one another. I have here a little dog that my girls gave to me several years ago. It was a little art craft. And you might be looking at it saying, what is that? You wouldn't know that it was a dog, perhaps, if you don't look at it first. But it's a very poor representation of uh, perhaps what we might consider a dog. But I love it. It sits on the shelf in my office. And it's a little craft that gave me a long time ago. What holds it all together? You might be wondering that yourself. It's glue, right? Glue holds this all together. Sometimes we might have glorious pictures in our mind of what the church looks like. But sometimes it, in life, looks a little bit more like this, right? What holds something like this all together? Love. 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 And it's no surprise when Paul is talking with the Corinthian church about their giftedness and their calling in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that he shows them a more excellent way after he talks about their gifts. And it was love that he went to. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great glorious chapter on loving one another. How do we fit together through the glue of love? And so he also says in the book of Ephesians, rather speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And love is something to be fought for. Notice here in our text, he says, verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. This is very strong language where God is calling us to hate evil, hate anything that would break God's fellowship among his people, hate the sinfulness of our flesh, hate everything that goes against God and his kingdom, and instead hold fast like a newlywed couple clings to one another in their newfound marriage. This is a picture of what love looks like. And it's a picture of this loving relationship in a family where we're going to conclude this morning. Not only are we to pursue genuine love from the heart, but notice we pursue steadfast love. In verse 10, he says, love one another with brotherly affection. The reason I say steadfast love here in this point is because both those terms, the word love one another and the words brotherly affection, have the same root philo. The first word is the word, or the second word is the word Philadelphia. What does the word Philadelphia mean? It's the city of what? Brotherly love. This word is talking about love that we see in the context of a family. You know, there's agape love. We show broadly towards everyone, reflecting the love of God. But this Philadelphia, this brotherly love, It's talking about family. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a part of the family of God. And that is a wonderful comfort to us as believers. You've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. What does that mean? It's our way of saying that family relationships are stronger than any other relationship. They take priority. You know, we stick with our family members longer, don't we? We tend to give our family members a greater benefit of the doubt, don't we? And I'm talking about natural family members. I'm not talking about the body of Christ yet. Simply put, we are often far more loving to our family members, physical relations, than we are to other people. And what Paul is saying is that in the gospel, we have been made the family of God. Do you realize the significance of that spiritual relationship? It means that you should be steadfastly committed to other believers. It means that you should be genuinely gracious with them like you would with your own son or daughter. You know, as a pastor, 
I used to be tempted to look out on a congregation and see people coming to church on a Sunday, and they might just sit in a pew, then walk out and leave, and judge them in my heart, because I didn't see them serving as the part of the body. What I gradually became, came to realize was that I needed to be careful not to make assumptions about people. Because God doesn't call us to boast about what we do. Instead, he calls us to quietly serve one another in love. You know, there are many people in this church who are going around serving quietly, loving other people, not saying anything about it, and you may never see it. But what you don't realize is the body is doing its work. Unity amidst diversity. You don't always see it because their feet are covered. Walking around humbly, serving. And so what we need to do is love one another as family. So Paul says here, the end of verse 10, outdo one another in showing honor. This means that we go out of our way to speak highly of other Christians we praise God for their gifts. We build up the body. Do you have a hard time with certain Christians in your life? Let's be honest. Probably some people you'd prefer to be around more than others. And what this text is challenging us to do is to look for proactive ways to love everyone, to be grateful for one another's strengths, to be gracious with one another about our weaknesses because not every part of the body is going to function the same way and that's okay. Actually, it's more than okay. It's right and good and necessary because this is the way God has built the body of Christ. It's how it was meant to work. I've told people several times, sometimes I feel like I just come to church on a Sunday and show up and the body is doing its work. I really mean that. I am so thankful because there are so many of you who are patiently, humbly serving God with your giftedness as you know how in the different areas and the ways that he's called you to do it. And my encouragement to you is to do that more and more. To do it in a spirit of humility. Counting others more important than yourself. To do it Understanding your giftedness and your calling to serve the Lord and to do it in love out of a genuine desire to build up other believers in the gospel and seeking for God's grace in the areas where you fail. Because all of us will fail on this point, won't we? There will be times when we look at another member in the body and we wrongly judge them. And in those moments, God has given you a divine opportunity in your heart to confess your sin, forsake it, and find strength in the gospel yet again to do this more and more for his glory. So I pray that we would do that as we enfold believers into the life of the body, as this church grows and fits together. My prayer is that we would do this more and more in love. Let's ask God to help us to do that today. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these commands. Lord, I pray that we would not walk away from here feeling as if we need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but instead, I pray that we would fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and see that he has given us the grace to do this. When we fail, Lord, thank you that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And when we succeed, when we serve others, thank you, Lord, that you're the one who provides the grace and the strength to do it so that no man may boast, but instead we would give you glory. So I pray, Lord, that we would do this, that we would serve one another out of the power of the gospel, that we would love one another by your grace and for your glory. And we've just gotten a little snapshot, Lord, today of all the many and varied ways that you have equipped the body to serve one another. I pray, Lord, that we would do this more and more for your glory and your kingdom. Thank you so much for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that calls us to humility that calls us to serve, and that motivates us to love. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Thank you for that message, Pastor Cameron. Uh, my wife and I are fairly new to this church, but we see this in action here in this church from so many people, and we are so grateful to be a part of this church and seeing how the body of Christ right here in this assembly working together in unity and loving each other. And we're going to sing now, Make Me a Servant Like You, Dear Lord, Living for Others Each Day. Let's stand as we close in this, uh, this song. Amen, and may God bless you.